We've heard in, in, in the discourse up to the midterm elections, we've heard so much about tax cuts. Who should get them? Should they be extended? Are they key to keeping the U.S. recovery on track and, and getting the economy to grow again? Well, certainly extending the tax cuts that are in place uh, for the next couple of years makes imminent sense given where we are in the business cycle. But frankly, the bigger question for voters in the United States is how big do you want government to be? If we want the government in the present administration's budget, we're going to have to raise a lot of taxes, not just the Bush tax cuts. So in some sense, the tax cuts are the small question. Size of government uh, is the big question. What, what should the, the dialogue be when it comes to solving the economic problems in front of us? What should, what should politicians be focusing on in order to get the macro house sort of back on track? Because everyone agrees it seems to be a very lackluster recovery. Well, the first step when you have a problem uh, is to figure out what the actual problem is. In a, in a recent book, I've argued in a book called Seeds of Destruction, the problem is long-term structural problems in our labor markets, in our public policy. We can't just have short-term fixes. So if policymakers are serious, they have to address those long-term problems in energy, in tax, in health care, in entitlements, then we can get the ship right. So that makes it sound like the, the discussion about whether to extend the Bush tax is just noise. It's just political noise, and it's not going to do anything to help the situation that we're in. Well, it's not noise, but it's, it's close. I mean, the really big thing is what do we want government to do in our society? That's a political choice. Once we make that choice, then how do we pay for it? That's a tax reform choice. Right now, the American people are being told we could have a government that's 25% or more of GDP and a tax system that only raises 20% of GDP. That, that's not possible. So either we have to adjust our spending or adjust our taxes. Frankly, I hope we adjust downward spending. When I hear that it's the, the key to robust economic growth is tackling these long-term issues, I immediately think that is impossible given the environment in Washington. Can we make real progress in the areas that you talked about? Well, I think we not only can, we must. We have to realize that the problems we have in the labor market come from a period of inattention that we've had in public policy. The stagnation that we've seen in a lot of families' incomes isn't this year or last year. It's been going on for more than a decade. We have to think about what does it take to build skills for all of our workers? What does it take to have public policies that lower health care costs and not raise health care costs so you can keep more of your income and wages? Those are long-term questions. Policymakers have to pivot to this. There are some voices in Washington trying to do this, but not many. It, it, and, you, and, and yet they seem so far apart. It seems they can't even agree on a very short-term situation. We have a bitter you know, a, a tone to, to midterm elections. Um, how... What makes you confident that they can get together and have that discussion? I mean, they seem farther apart than ever. Well, I'm confident in the private sector of the United States and in the American people. This is still an incredibly innovative and entrepreneurial economy. It's an economy that's got some of the greatest growth potential in the world. I think if we listen to that private sector energy and channel it, we'll have a better message. I think what politicians and our leaders need to do is focus on real problems that are worrying voters. And those are about taxes, they're about health care, they're about energy, they're about the financial system, but without some of the harsh tone. Mm. But, you, you, you know, the Obama administration says they're doing that. They've done that by, by passing the health care reform bill and, and financial regulation. The Republicans say that they're doing that and that uh, the Obama administration is moving us to social. It doesn't seem like an environment for cooperation. I'm just wondering. I hear about um, tackling Medicare, tackling spending, uh, retraining the workforce. That all seems like higher spending. I I'm, not, I I'm not sure where you're getting the confidence that that's going to be accomplished. Well, I think, is there a center? Do we have to move more to the center? Is that, is that part, of the, part of the solution? I think there's definitely a center. And I think the center for American voters isn't very different from what it has been over the past 25 years or so of wanting a modest, efficient government that solves real problems. And so when I look at President Obama's spending plans for a very large increase in the size of government from the traditional norm over the past 40 years in the 20% of GDP range to say 25% or more, that really requires the American people to make a choice. Do we want that? And if we do, let's stop talking about the Bush tax cuts. Let's raise a lot of taxes, and by the way, not just on the wealthy, on everybody to pay for it. Or do we want to downsize government? 
that's really the conversation we've got to have. The problem is neither side is having that conversation with the American people. One side is talking about the low tax part. One side is talking about the high spending part. But those two are like ships passing in the night. A leader needs to connect those dots. Mm. Is it possible to, to reduce the size of government realistically in Washington? Because everybody campaigns on that, and yet the size of government grows and grows. It absolutely is. In fact, we have seen the size of government go up and go down uh, in modern American history. There's no reason we can't bring the size of government down closer to 20% of GDP. The real fight isn't about the next five years. The real concern ought to be the long term in our entitlement programs, because there you're talking about a size of government that could grow to 30 or 40 percent of GDP. That's way out of the American experience in terms of taxes and regulation to support that growth. I don't think that's what voters want. Investors see what's happening in Washington and say, um, actually, we don't mind that there seems to be so much disagreement. Gridlock is good. Gridlock is good for the markets. Do you agree with that? I think that's dead wrong uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think what a lot of investors mean is they're thinking back to the mid-90s. Bill Clinton was the president. Uh, The Republican Party had taken over the Congress. Uh, Very little happened. And what did happen perhaps had a more conservative tilt to it than in the earlier part of the Clinton administration. What people miss in that analogy is the economy was stuck but in a pretty good place uh, in the 1990s. We're stuck now but not Uh, in a very good place. We actually need positive change, and we need a president and a Congress who can lead that. The second sense in which the argument isn't good is look at the uncertainty in tax rates on investment. Will the tax rate on dividends next year be 15% or 40? I don't know. Will the top rate rise dramatically for small business owners? I don't know. And when you talk to CEOs, they're very worried about this uncertainty in their planning. So I I think gridlock is not our friend. Mm. What's the biggest criticism uh, you have for uh, lawmakers in Washington right now on both sides of the aisle? Well, I think we need to focus on the pressing economic problems. Uh, The administration has really focused on a policy agenda that wasn't really related to the economies here and now. Healthcare reform is an example. I don't think it's very good policy, but even if I did, it wasn't really related to the economic crisis. The Republicans have also not really championed reforms of tax, of entitlement, of health care on their own that would be a good substitute. Both sides really have to sit down, figure out common ground, and by the way, there is common ground, and come together. That's what I've really pushed for uh, in this book, Seeds of Destruction, because there is common ground out there in Washington if you look for it. You teamed up with, uh, you crossed the aisle wrote the book with a Democrat, you're a Republican. When it comes to entitlement, uh, it's been said over and over again, it's the third rail of American politics. It's political suicide to talk about reining in costs for Social Security and Medicare. You just cannot get elected and you cannot govern if you try to do that. Um, did you together find a way past that? Is that is that uh, antiquated thinking or does that still hold true? I think it is antiquated thinking and Peter Navarro, my co-author and I believe there are plenty of ways in the middle to do it. If you speak to young people, they realize there's a huge problem uh, we have in entitlements and somebody will have to pay and that somebody is them and I think the way to get politicians to agree on a reform is to say well let's step back and what, what do we want to do? We need to fix Social Security Medicare, Medicare and we need to do so in a way that doesn't disadvantage the least well-off among us. So for Social Security, it's pretty simple. Let's just slow down the benefit growth for upper-income households. We can fix Social Security, and we can do it in a way that Democrats should like. But there's not a senior citizen in the world that'll let you in office, right? I mean, isn't that the problem? There are more baby boomers than there are younger people. Uh, At least they don't go out, get the vote out in the same way. So it's been very hard to get past the people who are benefiting from the current system, which is broken. Well, I think the way you get around that is to have a reform that phases in. So nobody's talking about this for current seniors or even people who are right at retirement, but more for a deal for people in my age, in the early 50s. Here's a way we're going to change the rules of the game. I think there's a real deal there. Social Security is not particularly hard to fix uh, if you do that. You give uh, the Democratic Party its way by saying we're actually going to strengthen benefits for low-income people. All the adjustment is on high-income people. You give the Republican Party its way because you say we're not going to raise taxes to do this. Medicare, we've got to go after health care reform. I think we just took a wrong turn. 
So we're going to have to fix that first. Mm. Do you feel that when you're in Washington and when you're talking to people down there, do you feel like they understand this and that they listen? I think there's a lot of listening in Washington, uh, not so much because of, of me or other economists, but more I think many of our leaders have gone home to their districts and heard from voters there's real problems in the economy. The problems didn't happen yesterday. They're long term. We want you, our representative, our senator, our president, to come up with problem solving techniques. That's what the American people want. You know, from an international perspective, people are watching this from the outside, looking at the debt load we carry, looking at the divisions in government, and saying, uh, pointing to this as evidence that it's the decline of America as an economic superpower. Uh, do you feel that? there's some truth in that uh, and you know that the economy is sort of going to be stuck in this subpar growth uh, and that these problems are only going to get bigger or do you feel that uh, th maybe that's a bit premature? I don't feel that way at all. The nation that defeated communism and fascism can certainly wrestle with Medicare and Social Security. The 1970s were a time of great despair in the US economy, high unemployment, high inflation, low productivity growth things turned around with much better policies. We have every reason to be optimistic, but hope is not a strategy. Politicians need to do serious long-term looks, and they're perfectly capable of doing so.